Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this forum. Uh, or good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you might be. This is a global audience, and it's a pleasure to welcome you um, to this uh, panel. Um, my name is David Theo Goldberg. I'm the director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute, which is the system-wide University of California Institute for the humanities and uh, interpretive social sciences across all 10 campuses that make up the UC system. Welcome to the forum focusing on the current attack on critical thought in France and its relation to broader political logics uh, and movements. Just some housekeeping details. It's a pleasure uh, that Françoise Vergès will be our principal moderator for our wonderful panel. So Françoise, perhaps you can join us. After I introduce her, she will introduce the panel. Um, I'll give a few framing remarks and then she will too, setting the discussion to work. Each panelist will offer a five minute, more or less opening statement. The panel will engage in the discussion until about 15 past the next hour, wherever you happen to be or whatever your time zone is. And then we will open for audience questions. Uh, the chat is turned off. I think you all by now know the uh, the Zoom drill. If you have a question, please pose to the Q&A function uh, on, the, on the Zoom, um, at the bottom of your Zoom uh, face. We will leave a few minutes at the end for panelists' uh, closing statements. So let me just begin with a few uh, short words. Perhaps the, uh, all the panelists can, can join us uh, in video now as well. Um, as we are seeing almost everywhere, the current surfacing of attacks on critical thought, of course, has wider application than in France, even as each national instance is unique in its specificity. In the United States, ethnic studies has borne the brunt of current attacks, but also any critical analysis of the Israeli state in relation to Palestinians, as they have in the past. In dominant European countries like Germany and France, institutional politics have taken aim at what has come of late to be identified under the banner of post-colonial studies, which is deemed to be inherited from quote American academic discourse because foreign to European values of universalism and post-war, so to speak, non-racialism. One might ask provincializing Europe, anyone? Have any of the current critics actually read any of the critical literature? This mobilization, um, sorry, there's a curious inversion at play. In the 1980s and 1990s, the dominance of Parisian intellectual influence, if not intellectual imperialism, was bemoaned by the conservative attack on critical ideas and progressive political shaping in the US. This seems now reversed, perhaps turn around is fair play. Claims at least implicit to French exceptionality reinforces nationalist refusals of the mobile, migratory, and relational interplay of ideas, which like environmental forces and perhaps now the pandemic, pay little attention to borders and boundaries. And curiously, the current insistence among French politicians and insular, insular intellectuals today that post-coloniality has no reference point in the French case implicitly acknowledges the ongoing commitment of the French state to its extended coloniality. Thinking the constitutively relational conditions opens up ways of seeing, critiquing, and facing down the debilitating initiatives being mobilized and forges a new possibilities of solidarity within and across the social conditions in question. To Ruff and Fanon, when they speak of France, everyone else should pay attention as they are speaking about you too. So it's on something like this canvas that our discussion will proceed today. It's a pleasure to introduce Françoise Vergès. She's a long time interlocutor and co-programmer with UCHRI, and it's a delight to have renewed our engagement for this forum. Françoise has an extended history of intellectual production, political art and cultural curation. She currently serves as the chair of the French National Committee for the memory and history of slavery, of her too many books to cite here. The latest include Un Feminisme de Colonial, 
which was Le Fabrique Edition in 2019, and in English, more recently, The Wombs of Women, Race, Capital and Feminism from Duke in 2020, translated from a French version published a couple of years before that. So over to you, Francoise, thanks very much. Well, good evening and thank you, David, for a very generous introduction. Thank you, of course, to David Theo Goldberg, to Ushri and the team for hosting us. I will, so tonight, I will, you know, I, uh, our guests, sorry, in the order in which they would be speaking will be Didier Fassin, Muriel Maladevis, Nadia Marzuki, and Nadia Yalaki Sudiki. So I will introduce them before. I will just say just a few words also in, as an introduction. It was David who had the idea of organizing uh, some form of exchange on what is it's happening in France, but also in the USA, in the UK, in Germany, and many other country. Attack on the university, on research, on social science and the humanities, on medical research, you know. And what did it say, all this attack? What did they say about the current moment? I, of course, agreed. In France, the attack are not new. And I will say a few words on that history. But it was a declaration of Frédéric Vidal the, in, on February 14. She's a minister of higher education and research who say, and I quote, that Islam leftism is a gangrene attacking the society as a whole and the university. And she asked that the National Center for Scientific Research uh, conduct an assessment of all the research taking place in France. And she clarified later that it was to distinguish between academic research and activism. This declaration, when students in France are queuing in front of food banks, are poorer and poorer, cannot follow their classes, and some of them are even committing suicide when a university are impoverished. This, when the country is unable to overcome the pandemic, that poverty is increasing and it cannot even vaccinate in some population. Vidal, I say, is not the first to raise the threat of Islamo leftism and of the threat to French universalism and, French and Republican value and this threat are, you know, communitarism, separatism, indigeneity, decolonial theory, postcolonial studies, inclusive writing, denunciation of blackface, cancel culture, wokeness, all this, of course, coming from bad America. University, you know, as in France, and also they say that as in the United States, white men now cannot say a word, you know, and must constantly be on guard about what they are saying. The attack come from the far right, the right, but also from the center left and even the left, from feminists, from journalists, from intellectuals. Endless debate on TV, radios, articles, books, documentaries, you know, present a French society under attack by Islam. Islamo leftism, according, and apparently was invented, but it's not very clear by Pierre André Taguiev, to describe, and I quote, a certain leftist third worldism, which found itself in pro Palestinian mobilization, in particular uh, in alliance with Islamist. Islam, Palestine, third worldism, these three things, these three elements will come back over and over in this construction of the threat that Islamo leftism represent. Islam has also naturally hostile to women's right. And you know, I can quote Caroline Fouras saying, Islamo leftists are those who in the name of a communitarian and American vision of identity fight universalist feminism and secularism. So, this Islam that Islamo leftists are defending is hostile to women's rights, is hostile to the enlightenment, to Christianity, to civilization. But in fact, if we look back, we can see the roots of this moment in 1989 in the attack on the veil in school by white feminists who relentlessly attack you know, Islam and the veil as a sign, as a symbol 
of submission that led to the 2004 law against the, the wearing, the wearing sorry, of any religious symbol in school, but it was really the veil that was you know, targeted. And I want to connect that, and this is, will be a question that I will want to ask to our guests, that I have also noticed that a lot of the, the person who are targeted in the attack uh, you know, nowadays are women, mostly women. So if that's, if there's something there, you know, the names that come back in the petition, in the letter, in the articles on name of women, when we don't even have their, you know, photo or so. All these have roots in the colonial and racial history, in what Cesar and Fanon have described. But we can see also that the, under the presidency of Nicolas Sarkozy, François Hollande and Emmanuel Macron, there was an acceleration. Let's you know, remember very quickly that Sarkozy wanted a Ministry of National Identity, that François Hollande wanted to modify the constitution to include the state of emergency regime and the extension of the deprivation of nationality to hold dual national convicted of terrorism, even those who were born in France. He wished also to be able to expel more rapidly foreigners who represented an especially serious threat to public order or to country security. His Minister of Interior, Manuel Valls, declared after the 2004 attack that he had enough with excuses and cultural or sociological explanation because to explain was to excuse. Since 2019, the attack have intensified petition, books, debate on TV, radio article, you know, showing, you know, disturbing moment of Islam. This really set up a fear, even though as Juliette Gallionne and Patrick Simon, I found that only between, you know, 1960 and 2000, only 2% of article in social science journal and magazine were on race and, you know, and race question. So this is what we are, you know, uh, seeing today. Telling all the story will take much longer time and we will have, in fact, really to impact all the different, you know, uh, people and how this, you know, coalesce and contribute to, co to produce this situation. But let me now turn to our guest and let me introduce our first speaker, Didier Fassin. Didier Fassin is a trained physician and anthropologist who holds position in social science at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton and is Director of Studies in Political and, Mor and Moral Anthropology at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. His latest of many books include Life, a Critical User Manual, which is a translation of a French book published in 2018, and Mort d'un Voyageur, Une Contre Enquête, at Seuil 2020, the edited volume, A Time for Critic, with Bernard Arcourt at Columbia University Press in 2019, and Deepening Divides, How Territorial Borders and Social Boundaries Delineate Our World, Pluto Press 2019. And so we ask each of our guests to give like a five, six minute general statement how they see the current moment and how they analyze this accusation of Islamo leftism. Didier? Yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Francoise and David, for organizing this event. The recent public accusation by Frédéric Vidal, the French Minister of Higher Education and Research, that society as a whole and universities more specifically are corrupted by Islamo leftism, which she sees as an, quote, alliance between Mao Zedong and the Ayatollah Khomeini, unquote has raised indignation and generated protest from uh, social scientists and scientific institutions. And even the French president has seemed to distance himself from these affirmations. However, 
one should not forget that six months earlier, Emmanuel Macron, one week after the death of George Floyd, and two days before a massive demonstration against police violence and racism in France, made the academic world guilty, his word, for having encouraged what he called the ethicization of the social question, and thus contributed to what he called, again, the fracture of French society. And four months later, his Minister of Education had gone further even, deploring that Islamo-leftism wrecks evoc is in universities and blaming France's old, oldest national student union for being the, quote, intellectual perpetrator of the assassination of a, 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 a professor um, in high school. This accusatory language has received the support of the Rassemblement National, making Macron's Machiavellian calculation clear, and one should not forget that the French president wrote his undergraduate uh, dissertation on the author of The Prince. The plan that leading is the plan is that leading his party on the tails of the far right will help him win against Marine Le Pen in the second round of the 2022 presidential election, which polls predict to be very close. A confirmation of it is the fact that during his debate with Le Pen, the French Minister of the Interior ironically told her that he actually found her program toward Islam weak. This was for her an unexpected opportunity to present her party as less radical than it is commonly believed. However, a narrowly political reading of the accusations of Islamo-leftism misses the broader picture. The term is symptomatic of a culture war that crosses the traditional ideological division between left and right. The association made by Vidal between Islamo-leftism and academic studies on race, gender, and social class is a signal not only to conservatives, but also to an influential segment of French intellectuals. In recent years, a lively reactionary movement has taken off in the academy, targeting research on ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, and international intersectionality, as well as colonialism, post-colonialism, decoloniality, and Islamophobia. This list even extends to the reversal, to the chagrin of the Académie Française, of the 17th century grammar rule, according to which the masculine prevails over the feminine. By reaction, I mean an anxious rejection of the evolution of society, politics, and ideas, and a nostalgic endeavor to reestablish the past social, political, and intellectual order of things. The so-called observatory of decoloniality, an intellectual movement born at the beginning of this year, whose most famous figures are Pierre-André Taguieff and Nathalie Enich, denounces all allegedly non-universalistic approaches by parodying their language. The Republic Republican Spring, a political movement created in 2016 to combat the far right and political Islamism, with Laurent Bouvet and Marcel Gauchet, defends hardliner secularism, even having succeeded in canceling a conference on Islamophobia. Interestingly, the most recent and popular work in this line is by Stéphane Beau and Gérard Noiriel, two respected left-wing scholars of the working class for the former and immigration for the latter, who lament the replacement of class struggle by race struggle, denigrate post-colonial post studies, sneer at the category of gender, dismiss intersectionality, and even consider that Black Lives Matter failed for having, quote, obscured power relations structuring our societies, end quote. From the perspective of these reactionary academics, race studies research on racial discrimination and the language of white privilege are seen as a threat to Republican universalism 
and for some even as anti-white anti racism. The analysis of the colonial past and its present legacy, which with few exceptions has long been a blind spot in French historiography and soci sociology is regarded as divisive and ideological. Meanwhile, organizations opposed to gay marriage, such as the influential uh, Manif Pour Tous, have politicized gender, sexuality, and intersectionality to the point of obtaining the uh, defunding of scientific programs on these questions. Curiously, these putative identity politics are all suspected to have been imported from US campuses without consideration from the fact, for the fact that race relations have initially been studied in Britain, that the concept of decoloniality comes from Latin America, that the circulation of these theories are global, and that many of the ideas under critique were influenced by the so-called French theory. A remarkable feature of the reactionary movement is indeed its almost complete ignorance of the international literature. So just to conclude, behind the public accusation of Islamo-leftism in the university with its cynical strategy to seduce the right and far right, there is thus another more complex and no less somber picture, that of a reactionary movement, which strive, strives to defame theories that have been developed for a better understanding of current social issues, and consequently, to deny or depreciate the disparities and injustices for which new instruments of analysis are provided. The improbable invention of the chimera of Islamo-leftism has thus permitted the convergence of Emmanuel Macron and his party with the Rassemblement National on the one hand and with the reactionary segment of the intellectual world on the other. This cannot be without evoking the 1930s when the resort to another chimera, Judeo-Bolshevism, served the same purpose. The parallel between the two periods should not be pushed too far, but the recent evolution of French politics is deeply disturbing and certainly deserve vigilance. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. And we will come certainly back to your remark. So our next speaker is Muriam Ale Davis, who teaches history at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work focuses on Algerian history, and she has a forthcoming book on Algerian the reinvention of the market economy in the post-war years and its impact on race and identity on both sides of the conflictual line. Her co-edited volume, North Africa and the Making of Europe, was published by Bloomsbury in 2018. She's also actively involved with Jadaria. Muriam? Thank you, Francoise, and thank you, David, for inviting us all to be here. Um, also, thank you to the UCHRI team who puts this all together. I'd like to share a few thoughts about the historical roots of Islamo-Gauchism as a concept. What makes this legible in France? I think for an Anglophone audience, the words involved are actually quite confusing. Um, and then to reflect briefly on what kind of political work it's actually doing. The fact that it doesn't have a real existence does not mean that there's not real political work being done. Um, first of all, the term gauchisme, uh, which at which during um, a certain period of French history came to mean an infantile version of the left that did not fall in line with the communist party and that had certain kinds of third worldist commitments. Um, so already there was an attempt to discipline what the left should look like by using this term. And in this compound word, um, Islam is a purposefully ambiguous signifier. Is it those who study Islam those who are sympathetic to certain articulations of political Islam, or who as, they, who, as the state would like us to think, excuse violence in the name of Islam. And so this amalgamation of terms is precisely uh, at the heart of the debate. I also think it's important to point out that there was a Cold War imaginary where Islamists 
and totalitarian regimes shared a certain ideological form. So a commitment to unfreedom, for example, or a passionate set of attachments that were fundamentally irrational. So there was a twinning of pan-Islamism and communism that dates back to an earlier history as Didier has just invoked. Um, I know better, but I was recently listening to a debate on France 24 where somebody brought up uh, Gaddafi as a precedent for Islamo Gauchism. And of course, this is a, a quite intentional invocation, but all of these attempts to stretch Marxism to think about other forms of whether that's Islam or indigeneity, which was part of a decolonization project, is now being policed. Um, and I would argue that the question of Islam has long been used to discipline the forms of acceptable leftist politics in France. Um, I'm, I was grateful that David brought up the question of Palestine in Tagiev's early formulation of this, Palestine played a very important role. Um, and perhaps we could come back to where we stand with that. Um, it, it might seem as though the more pressing concerns of uh, ex making excuses, quote unquote, or apologists for terrorism have come to occupy some of that place. Um, in a longer durée history as well, these debates reflect a investment in the division of race from religion. And I think this is also something that to an American audience can be a little bit strange. Um, the notion that religion is something that you choose and race is something assigned to you through biology, right? Through skin color in the American context. And I would just point out in the Algerian context, um, Islam was a juridical marker that structured access to life and property and a certain kind of legal discrimination. So even conversion did not get one uh, to a better subject position as it were. So this notion um, that some on the left have said that there is a right to be Islamophobic because Islam is about what you believe and not what you are, right? This has become a refrain um, that goes back to uh, the French Revolution in some ways saying, no, we fought uh, for anti-clericalism uh, and the left cannot get involved in religion. That's one of the principles of leftism. Um, and so there is also this broader history of religion's role in politics, uh, both in the colonial and uh, metropolitan framework. Um, I appreciated also Didier's remarks because this is for in many ways, a discussion on the center and in the left. Um, the far right uh, is um, in some ways uh, outside of these debates um, about you know, what constitute racism. Um, of, we know that Marine Le Pen and her past and her father's past, that's not really the, the principal um, subject at hand. Uh, many times people who use the accusation of Islamo-Gauchism uh, are donning the mantle of anti-racism themselves. So they say, I am committed to anti-racism. Uh, and they go on to say, what you're talking about cannot be racism and is therefore not subject to the debate. Um, I will very quickly just mention what I think this work is doing right now. Um, it's already been invoked that Macron has a broader project to fundamentally change the structures of the state with the twin, uh, another twinning of threats of austerity um, and authoritarianism. So the law on so-called Islamist separatism or the global security law are not only about um, about uh, discriminated against populations and peoples, but also about activism writ large. So there's, there's a larger context to the reshaping of these structures. That's something we're seeing globally from India to China to the US even. Um, and as um, my last remark is, you know, also picking up on this notion of importing American uh, approaches when all along we thought we were doing French theory and perhaps uh, nudging back against it a bit. Um, the, the dream of empiricism, that this is not real science, this is not real research by people who have not read any of it, who don't seem to understand the concepts at all, makes it no less dangerous. Um, and I appreciated what Didier said as well about a nostalgia because I think that empiricism offers a kind of promise of restitution, that we knew what real science was. And it was when a generation of scholars who were not people of color were setting the research agenda. It was okay if they were in classrooms, as long as they were setting and doing the work we had given them as appropriate topics. Um, so I'll stop there and thanks again um, for being here. Thank you, Miriam.
And I'm sure we will also go back to some of your remarks. The, the third speaker is Nadia Marzuki. She's a research fellow at the Center National, uh, at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, Paris. She received her PhD in political science for Sciences Po in 2008. Her work examined public controversy about Islam and religious freedom in Europe and the United States, and debate about religious freedom and democratization in North Africa. She's currently working on progressive economic alliance and interfaith movement in the United States and the Euro-Mediterranean area. She's the author of Islam and American Religion, Columbia University Press 2017, and she co-edited Saving the People, How Populist Hijack Religion in 2017 at Oxford University Press. Mur Nadia? Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thanks, David and Francoise, and to thank you to the um, UCHRI. Uh, thanks, Didier and Mariam, for your fascinating comments. Um, I want to start with just um, expressing sort of general feeling of uh, fatigue and stress and repetition that uh, I, as an Islam scholar in the social sciences, and I think many of my colleagues feel right here in France and all over uh, Europe and the US. And uh, I was talking to Miriam a, a couple of days ago and we were, we were complaining about how we feel like, you know, we're basically at the same place as we were uh, about six years ago. Um, so there's been a lot of focus right now on Islamogoshism, but the reality is that a lot of people who work in the social sciences around Muslim societies and practices have been dealing with the same degree of hate and attacks for the past six years, often in isolation. And um, especially this, this all started mostly, I think, in the context of the post Charlie Hebdo and post Bataclan had attacks and, France has been dealing with this trauma since then at the expense um, to, a long, to, to, a, to a certain extent of acad the academics working on, on these issues. So um, there, there, is, there is very much among, among scholars of, of, of our um, community this, this feeling that it's basically the same over and over again. And we, we are witnessing today's conversation with, a mix, with mixed feelings. We feel, uh, we feel like we've seen that over and over again. We've, we are happy with the extent of the solidarity that is uh, somewhat new, but we also feel somehow saddened by the fact that uh, as scholars of Islam, we have experiencing these attacks in isolation for many years. And we were sort of already mentioning all these issues. And I wanna really salute here the work of all my friends and colleagues, uh, Miriam, but also uh, Beth Hurd, Sonia, uh, Diane Arsbrun, uh, Anver Iman, a, a, a number of them are here today, and they've been they've been precious allies uh, in in all these years. Uh, what has changed is the level of unity and solidarity among academics uh, today in France in face of these uh, unacceptable attacks. And I really want to follow up on what uh, Miriam and Didier have have already said to reiterate how I think these comments made by uh, Frédéric Vidal are absolutely unacceptable. They are endangering us, they are threatening us, they have caused, uh, they have unleashed a level of anger and a, self, a sense of self-righteousness among some right-wing trolls who are now publishing lists of names of academics and basically giving license to witch hunt them. And this is unacceptable. And I think um, this, this has to be really uh, emphasized over and over again. Um, the level of unity and solidarity and support from institutions, from the CNRS, from the universities, is something really uh, uh, that is very much appreciated and somewhat uh, new because of the intensity of, of the attacks. Um, the level of unity and solidarity from academics uh, beyond the study of the Muslim world 
is related to the fact, as Didier mentioned, that um, the attackers have, in a way that is very confusing, epistemologically lumped together a number of disciplines and topics, decolonial studies, post-colonial studies, gender studies, race studies, ethnic studies, Islamic studies. So everything is lumped together in a very confusing way to describe the enemy that is infiltrating the academia and that is intoxicating the minds of young students. So I think because Islamo leftism is sort of the pretext and the excuse to attack a number of stu studies uh, that are deemed uh, the result of the influence of US academia, this is, ex this is what explains the unprecedented level of uh, unity against the attacks of the, of the government. Um, I do want to pause, however, and maybe um, bring a question to this conversation, which is around um, maybe some challenges and some questions around this notion of allyship and solidarity uh, within this big constellation of academics who are now united against uh, Vidal asking for her resignation and uh, defending academic freedom. And I want to say that I feel uh, I feel sort of torn be, be, uh, in front of the solidarity because obviously this is what is needed right now, a broad coalition to produce outcomes. But as a scholar of Islam who has been uh, the target, uh, not, not me, but not just me, me and all my colleagues, I, I really uh, don't want to speak in my name right here, but as scholars of Islam who have been targeted by this type of hate and violence and threats for so many years, we also feel like there may be some misunderstanding as to what exactly is defended in these big coalitions. So the broad, the broad argument is that we're all standing together for academic freedom, all right. And another argument is that, well, actually it's not really anymore about scholars of Islam, it's about scholars of race, of gender, and also post-colonial world and a bunch of other things. And I wanna pause maybe here on the juxtaposition of three things, Islam, race, and gender. And this sort of like flattening of these three contexts, these three concepts. And I, um, I as a scholar of Islam, we, we have been confronted with major disagreements and debates around gender and freedom and the contours of this discussion. And we haven't always had the support of gender scholars far from it. There's been a lot of, on the contrary, they've off, like sort of secular feminists have often been the major instruments of the attacks against us, arguing that we are propo proposing all sorts of obscurantist oppressive agendas and imposing them on, on students and academia. So I would want to see not now, because that's not the time, but in the next step, a productive conversation among gender scholars, especially secular feminist scholars who claim to be our allies right now, but I've been to so, in so many conversations around these pressing issues. And what I've noticed is that there's always an unease when it comes to Islam. So we talk about Islamogoshism, but then no one wants to talk about Islam anymore. Everyone's like, yeah, 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 it's not about Islam. It is about Islam. It is about race. It's about this and only this. And I'm not comfortable with this shift that seems very convenient to say, well, it's just about academic freedom. All right, but the academic freedom of some is threatened way more than the academic freedom of others. So this is something I'm really hoping in the next step we're gonna have as a productive conversations about all these people who claim to be allies. And one last thing, and I'll finish with that, Francoise, is that I wanna maybe suggest a comparison between the type of solidarity and allyship I have witnessed um, at the grassroots level after George Floyd's murder in France, the whole protest or with uh, Comité Adama and all sorts of things, and the type of allyship 
that seems to be more problematic at the level of academia. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. It's a very interesting point and there will be a lot to say. And uh, I do think that effectively the question of gender and uh, feminism will be, is very important in that conversation. But the question of alliance, I mean, we will go back, go back to that. Let's not start the debate. So our next speaker and last speaker is Nadia Yalaki Sudiki, who teaches philosophy at the University of uh, Paris 8 Vincennes. She has written widely on African philosophy and art. She also serves as the adjunct director of the research center called Les Logiques Contemporaines de la Philosophie, Contemporary Logics of Philosophy. Her book on Bergson, Bergson ou l'Humanité Créatrice, was published in 2013. She's also the co-curator of the Yango Biennale in Kitshasa. Yala? So thank you very much for uh, this uh, conversation. Um, I'm very happy to be here, even if we are all here for uh, very difficult uh, reasons uh, and very, uh, and it's quite hard. And I want to uh, follow uh, what Nadia said because the, the fatigue is very high and uh, our mental health are completely attacked and those moments are very difficult to live in the now in this situation of the academia in, in France. But I think there are many ways to understand uh, what is uh, happening now. Many ways to interpret and to explain uh, the genealogies of those attacks. I'm not an historian of the ideas, but I just would like to focus on a word, separatism, kind of new word that is now in the French uh, Republic. Um, when did it appear? Or perhaps uh, when was this word used by the head of state? And what was brought to the fore by this word? I don't want to draw too many cliches about my country. I will try, really. But if I want to caricature uh, the type of political we have since more than 40 years. And I think I wasn't two words, universalism versus communitarism, particularism, I would say ethnicity in English, a kind of gigantomachie that describes the struggles defining the French Republic mythology. Okay, we all know that the idea of universalism in France, we also have a very strange expression, French universalism, a very quite uh, singular oxymoron. But the idea of universalism in France is intimately linked, you know that, with the French Revolution. And this idea is that all of the humans share the faculty of reason and that as a French citizen, we all have the same political rights, regardless of religion, sex, race, ethnicity, etc. This strong idea is bound up with the idea of laicity, the strict separation between the state and the church, and another powerful idea, the idea of the indivisibility of the Republic. Our differences, religious particularities, don't have the power to divide us. We are citizens before being individuals, before being Muslims, Black, women, etc., etc. So the enemies of the French republics are the ones who claim their differences and break this Republican pact by putting their individuality over their citizenship. What we call in French, communautarism, I could translate with ethnicity or particularism. That is to say, the idea that minorities come together as closed communities structured around specific social, cultural characteristics, such as race, religion, ethnic, etc. Therefore, the claim of difference is a conscious destruction of a political space defined as one and indivisible. That is the story. What is happening now? The terms are changing and they are all turned upside down. And what we can say is that the language completely falls apart. Anti-racism has become racism. Chauvinism, strong chauvinism, strong nationalism has become universalism. First, 
the idea of universalism is used now to support assimilationist, conservative political claims. Being universal just means being French, a real French. And you all know what a real French means. Second, as the Republic is indivisible, it is almost impossible to express the idea that there are discriminations, especially racial discriminations in France. Indeed, the reaffirmation of social cultural characteristics to denounce unequal treatments is seen as the promotion of a particularism that divides the Republic. It becomes impossible for the people who are discriminated to explain the reasons why they are discriminated. And third, we don't use the word communautarism, particularism anymore, but the word separatism. After the huge uh, anti-racist demonstrations that took place in France, especially in Paris last June, and organized by the Adama Committee, close to the Black Lives Matter movement, this, st this statement was made by our, by our politics and even our um, president. The idea of community is a very strong idea. It is a concrete idea. And there are communities everywhere. If we want to be more precise, we must not condemn the word communitarism, communitarism, but because the real enemy of the Republic is separatism. Are separatists those movements or people that breaks the Republic in two? I'm quoting our president. So the idea of separatism appeared after the death of George Floyd, after the huge anti-racist demonstrations that took the streets of Paris, after the lockdown to the pandemic. So one question, what is the link with critical thought and especially post-colonial studies and decolonial turn and this idea of separatism coming after those uh, huge demonstrations? Those studies, and it was already said by uh, the, the panelists, those studies are seen as the ideological foundations of this anti-racism that destroys the Republic because anti-racism destroys the Republic. It's a kind of sophism that I don't understand, but perhaps we will have to hear. Ideological foundations of anti-racism, ideological foundations of separatism. I want to quote the French uh, president uh, during a very important uh, discourse. Uh, when the, the, the law uh, against separatism uh, was voted, it was, I think, on October 2, I mean, um, three months ago. And the president said, targeted, of course, Islam. And there is a little sentence that is really interesting. He also said that uh, we, have to be, um, we have to be concerned with those children of the Republic coming from immigrant descents or that are from Maghreb, Sub-Saharan Africa, because those children of the Republic coming from Maghreb and Sub-Saharan Africa are seduced by those studies of post-colonial, decolonial trends that are ideological foundations of separatism. This discourse is very scandalous. And this is a cynical way to target the enemies of France. Those young, I will be quite direct, those young black and Arab scholars who benefited from the generosity of the Republican meritocracy are now the people who are destroying France. The struggle against separatism becomes a struggle that was fed from within by a generous republic. A generous republic that must now fight against those inassimilable citizens embodied by scholars of colors. So I think that one of the questions we have to, to, uh, to, to have here during this uh, discussion is uh, perhaps a, a very difficult question that is 
difficult to to have in France in the academia, uh, as you said, uh, Nadia, is still about we cannot we cannot pronounce the no the noun racism anymore, and it is very hard to describe and to understand or to underline the different strategies of structural racism that are still impacting the French academia. Thank you, Yala. I mean, first I would want to, to see if any of you have a question for the other, for instance, if after listening to each other, if you know, uh, Muriel would want to ask Nadia or Didier would want to ask uh, Yala or whatever first, I mean, you know, because it's a conversation. And there are also, you know, two or three things that um, I, 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 you know, I, I noted and I would want to ask, uh, 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 unless also David has some question before um, that, he, he, if you want. I mean, I wanted also, I mean, perhaps I have a question for each of you, um, you know, because um, did you, you were saying that this um, reactionary movement over there must also, I mean, at the end, to uh, deny the disparities of, uh, you know, that, that was going, you know, are going on. And um, it's true, uh, but uh, how do you, what I, I want to, to know that how do you see the, um, at the same time of Macron, the famous en même temps, you know, that we do this and we do that. How do you uh, in, uh, see in your analysis, uh, Macron doctrine of, you know, neither left nor right, um, that, uh, you know, uh, because he is always coming back to that. He's always saying, you know, trying to uh, do that. Um, uh, Miriam, the, the fact that when the, the question of the left is, cannot be um, involved in religion. I mean, that religion is, I find this very, very important because I have, no, for, I have noticed that the left does not understand anything about religion. I mean, the French left, I mean, they're, they're, you say religion for them, it's alienation and so on. And uh, the nostalgia, of course, the nost nostalgia for what was, but mostly this question of the religion, I would want you, if you can say more about that, because I do think it's important. Because I do, I, I wonder that if in France, Islam is a religion, but not quite really a religion, not really what is called a religion. So, you know, if you, if you could say something about that. Um, Nadia, I mean, you know, what is academic freedom? And it's true because I was also think, thinking of some of the reaction, you know, when some of this, the academics say Islamogoshism uh, is not really a scientific notion as if this was the point, you know, as if, you know, uh, and so if, since it was not a scientific notion, it, we could be, you know, protected and saved, you know. And uh, even though if we were Islam or leftists, what would be the point, you know? What what would be the danger? What would be the threat, you know? So, what would be? Uh, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, this posi this position from some uh, academic in France saying that Islam or leftism is not a real notion, is not a scientific notion, therefore there is, you know, that it, it almost, it does not concern academia. It doesn't concern us, you know, but because I do think it's connected with what you say, if I understood well. And uh, Yala, I thought, yes, effectively this thing that, you know, um, well, uh, we gave education, we civilized these people, you know, these young people, they could come to the university, they even speak French, you know, good French, and then they turn against us. You know, they are turning against us. And if you could say a little more uh, about that, because I do think that effectively there is also, and it, perhaps it's connected with what D, uh, Didier, Nadia, and Miriam were saying also, that um, is, I mean, their world is shaking. In, also, uh, it's it's it there. It and so, but if we do the, if we just see that as a reactionary. Do we see just that as a reaction, also, also uh, just as a melancholia from, you know, uh, and nostalgia or something else also, you know, the unresolved colonial question in France, 
and the connection between Republican value, what they call Republican universalism, and in fact, the civilizing mission, the colonial civilizing mission. I mean, David, do you have any? Thank you, Francoise, and thank you all for really trenchant and um, critical uh, remarks. I'd, um, I'd just to pose a sort of general kind of canvas of question, um, picking up from Nadia Mazuki's remark about, uh, about being really fatigued. Um, it's funny, just a day ago, Francoise and I, as we were preparing for this, we're talking about the condition of exhaustion. Right, and I was linking exhaustion, that, that notion of fatigue also to the exhaustion of the planet, right? I mean, the exhausting of the planet uh, through exhaustion, through a different related, but different kind of exhaustion. But I wonder about connecting this to um, the way in which, as Yellow was pointing out, anti-racism is being pointed to as destroying the Republic. I mean, the Republic has to be pretty weak if anti-racism is, is, you know, what is being brought to destroy it. I mean, one just has to sort of remark that, but, but, but to link it to the way in which the language of critique um, is both being taken away and inhabited by the, by the critics, by the right, right? Um, that is, the, the, you know, what conventionally was the language of anti-racism. And it happened, it's not just in France, it's pretty much everywhere. I mean, you see it in Germany, post-coloniality, but you've seen it for the last 40 years now, 35 years in the, in the US. I mean, it was a quite strategic undertaking on the part of the right and from Reagan onwards to inhabit the terms of progressive anti-racist critique and to turn it around against itself. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it takes away the language of critique from, from the critics of racism and makes it impossible then to designate what the thing is that one's critiquing, right? So it, it vacates the possibility of critique. And I wonder whether something like that is not going on in this instance as well. I mean, there's a, you know, in, in a way for non spoke of, uh, you know, standing inside uh, I mean, when he says I had incisors to test, right, um, in, in black skin, white mask, he's saying, I'm, you know, you're calling me an animal, let me show you what an animal looks like, right? And in a way, that strategy is being turned around against itself on the part of the right, inhabiting the very terms of critique, in order to evacuate them of any kind of um, critical effect. Um, and to take away the possibility of naming the very condition itself that is and should be the object of critique. And I, you know, I, I sort of see similar strategies at work on the right um, uh, over here. So I wonder whether there's something like that going on. Okay, we want to start. I mean, uh, do we start from the, uh, I mean, do we start from Yala, then Nadia, then Miriam, then Didier. So we do the other way. Yala, no, tu ne veux pas. Uh, you don't want. Okay, Nadia? Uh, sure. So um, I want to I wanna address uh, your, your question, um, Francoise, and, and also maybe um, say, say a few uh, words about um, um, this this Macron doctrine of en même temps Didier, if you don't if you don't mind, because um, I think it's linked this question of scientificity. Um, so I think uh, that it's it's a, it's a first of all in terms of the debating the reaction of academics and academic institutions, there's an issue of temporality. I think it made sense strategically in a first step to just have a strategy of calling out and just calling out the minister and say, she's just saying nonsense and that doesn't make any sense. And I think it's, it's, it's very brave and important for, for all these uh, academic institutions uh, to really uh, send this message 
message and stand out and call out. Uh, but then in a second, in a second step, I think uh, you're absolutely right that there is something very problematic in just being uh, content with this distinction, like between what's real, what's so what's real, really a social fact and what's just a fallacy, because we all know that this whole category of uh, is Islamo leftism ha has produced effect political effects that are very real and I that was the, the the meaning of my first intervention I think what what I find um, missing in conversations among academics right now is a is, is really an embrace of the political aspect of this discussion and of the political meaning of Islam and Islam or leftism and the the degree to which Islam has has been for uh, decades and remains the blind spot of the thinking of politics, but also of social sciences, because Islam is this, this just sort of embodies the ultimate other in a way, in the way maybe that race is in the US towards the, the history of the founding of the, the, the nation and, and the discussion of, of the founding of the US constitution. I would say Islam plays that role of the ultimate irreconcilable other of the French Republic. And and I don't see much debate among these coalitions that 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 are very well meaning in terms of defending academic freedom. But um, I, I think this question, this argument of what pertains to science and what pertains to unscience is actually very important in and a, a very important expression of the Macron moment, right? And uh, we talked a lot in the past days about how this is, this whole witch hunt is, a, is an expression of McCarthyism and of the polarization and the culture wars. But I think, and we've made comparisons with the Trumpist moment in the US, but I think there is something maybe specific to uh, develop and investigate in the French situation right now. And I really love, the phrase of French historian Pierre Cernat, who criticized Macronism as the ideology of extreme center, right? It's the it, and I, I think this is this expression is brilliant because it does capture the contradiction uh, and the ambiguity and the toxicity of this ideology center because it's the ideology of at the same time, en même temps, neither left nor right, etc. This is well known, but it is very extremely extreme and extremely toxic in the sense that it does support agendas and views that are in line with the liberal populist views you know, a la Hungary or uh, countries that are that have launched similar wars on academia, but it is disguised in the language of respectability and decency and civility and science. And all peop the people who attack us, the members of the observatory that Didier mentions, they rejoice in saying how they embody science and how we embody unscience. And they say, so in a way that's different from Trump because Trump was perfectly happy with saying, you know, he's happy with fake news. He doesn't believe in science and whatnot. Whereas the difference is that it's this toxic pretension to embody science, decency, civility, and portray the others as these radical dangerous infiltrators. So, um, I think this whole discussion about what science and what's not is extremely dangerous and it's a perfect in illustration of the toxic aspect of this ideology of the extreme center to again quote from Pierre Cernat. Thank you Nadia. Muriam, you want to go next? Yeah, Muriam? thank you. Um, Nadia, I appreciated your comments about the extreme center and it makes me think uh, that we're living also through a moment of kind of enlightenment fundamentalism, um, right? That Macron himself, it's about, the extreme center is also about embodying rationality and being able to discount those as infantile, as irrational, um, and positioning yourself somehow above it in this technocratic vein of uh, what I do is, is, is managing uh, and I'm, I'm beyond the politics of left and right. Um, and it made me think of something that I think ties into Francoise's question, uh, which is going back to Ernest Renan and the debate about Islam and science, right? And the notion, the exceptionality of Islam, one of the debates was always that it was incapable of producing the same kind of rational thought. Um, and so it's really interesting to me that Islam functions as this allegedly um, 
obvious signifier that we know what Islam means when, you know, that is, uh, as you have mentioned, the site of a lot of debates, both theological, sociological, um, etc. And so, Francoise, to get back to your question, um, you know, there is a sense, I think, Nadia, you um, pointed out this, that Islam has always been exceptional, going back to Napoleon, uh, who, you know, when he comes to Egypt, doesn't think he can do the same thing in Italy, because, you know, you have to rule Muslims through Islam, so you can't introduce the same kind of secularism. Um, the law of 1905, which, of course, is never applied in Algeria. I don't want to overdo my, my the historian thing here, um, but certainly there is an exceptionality, and what I find really interesting about the race question is that looking at texts, not only Renan, but Gobineau, uh, even Weber, there is a sense at which Islam is also about bloodlines. It's about bloodlines, it's about environment. Um, and so again, this notion that Islam is about uh, the Quran or the Hadith, and those of us who work on the Islamic world know that that doesn't mean anything, but bref, you know, we'll let that go. Um, that somehow this is, you know, not about a discourse on race and origin and environment in a 19th century capacity is just wrong. It's, it's, you know, if you read the text. And so I think that, you know, some of this um, argumentation, and I know this is not surprising, and perhaps it's, you know, I think it's quite naive in some ways to say, um, you know, you haven't done your homework when you have the, you know, the Minister of the Interior who when is asked about police violence says, oh, no, this is Weber 101. This is as old as Weber, right? I mean, uh, talk about a disrespect for what we do. So um, I'll leave it there. But thank you for those questions. Did you? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I want to start with uh, uh, what uh, Nadia and Yala uh, have said about fatigue. And <clears throat> I should say that uh, uh, I often think of my friends uh, or, or my children's friends who are Muslims and every time, every time coming back to whatever uh, this, this the, the, the event is uh, every time going back to, uh, to, to this, uh, um, this hostility against, uh, against Muslims and, uh, and very often Islam. Um, you may remember that, uh, that uh, when uh, to sort of close the uh, uh, Yellow Vest movement, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, proposed to do a grand debat, the great debate. Uh, <clears throat> there were 84 questions and he insisted in having uh, four questions, I think, two on uh, secularism and asking whether we should go further in secularism. So the question was oriented already and two on immigration asking whether we should have uh, more control on immigration, whether we should have quota of immigration. And these were not part of the, uh, of the uh, agenda or, or the list of, uh, uh, um, of recommendations or, or uh, requirement, requirement from the Yellow Vest movement. So, so and I think that, you know, coming all the time, you know, this fatigue that you're describing uh, is, I think, a, a fatigue also uh, from the uh, from many, I, I suppose, many uh, Muslims uh, with this coming back over and over. And since uh, you're asking about, uh, 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 Francoise, you're asking about, about Macron and, uh, and being neither left nor right, uh, I think many of us have never believed, even when he was, a, he was only a candidate, that he would be neither left nor right. He's a banker, uh, he comes from that world. And, um, and, and I always thought of uh, François Mitterrand's uh, um, uh, sentence about uh, the center and people who said they were neither right, right uh, nor left. He said, when, you, when I hear someone saying I'm neither right nor left, uh, no, no, no left, I think that uh, it is uh, a center that is neither right, neither left nor left. And, and I think that's the idea of being neither left nor left, uh, that is really what characterizes uh, Macron. And this is why to go to, go to um, David's uh, question about the weakness of the Republic, 
which I think is a very good diagnosis. Uh, there's, uh, and, and particularly in the case of uh, Emmanuel Macron, that's, that, that, of course, that's a structural problem, but there's a circumstantial uh, uh, issue with Emmanuel Macron, uh, uh, who, has, who was ready to deal with economic and financial issues, but was not ready to deal with uh, uh, protests and, uh, and, and uh, uh, social movements. And uh, by, lack, by lack of authority, it turned to authoritarianism, and which is which is very typical. I mean, we we have never had such a violent. Well, I, I mean, in the, in the recent decades, I, I, I should say, you know, in sixty in the sixties, uh, we, we had worse. But but in the in the recent decades, we've never had such a violent police. So the lack of authority goes with a need for authoritarianism. And, and I think that's, uh, that's a very good uh, diagnosis. Um, speaking of left and right, uh, I briefly touched it, but what, what makes the situation uh, uh, and the, ideolo the ideology uh, uh, of France very particular and these attacks uh, on uh, that we've described uh, the four of us or even the six of us um, is that you have an unusual uh, alliance between a certain left and most of the right a certain left which which is only able to think in terms of class and uh, most of the right uh, which is uh, focused on this false universalism that we've been uh, describing uh, before. And in that regard, uh, we, uh, uh, when, when we think of this false universalism, we have to remember, and at least for the, um, uh, for, for, for maybe a US, uh, for US uh, public audience, that it is only in the late 1990s that we started in France to speak about racial discrimination. And even it was discrimination and the uh, adjectival qualifier racial was very difficult to introduce uh, in, uh, in, the, in the debate. And, there, and this was a very, uh, very short uh, window of time when it was possible to talk about racial uh, discrimination. And then we saw this uh, terrible backlash that uh, uh, you have all uh, you have all described, and and finally, um, I uh, I would like to uh, to put in relation what we've been talking about uh, until now with the question of state xenophobia and the dealing with immigration, because uh, we have uh, uh, we have at the moment a terribly harsh. Uh, uh, practice, uh, police practice, and and policing, I would say, of immigration. I, I do uh, I, I I do my research at the moment at the French-Italian border, uh, um, and, uh, and 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 it is uh, it, there is a, a, a reinforcement, a strengthening of uh, the policing of the borders, but also uh, a brutality, brutalization of immigrants. Uh, in, in Calais, for example, but also in Paris, uh, 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 breaking the, uh, the, the tents where they are uh, trying to find a refuge, uh, 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 throwing all their, um, their belongings um, and, uh, and, and beating them up, um, which, is, which is something that, uh, that has to do with uh, what, uh, uh, what Yala was saying about uh, the children of, uh, of these immigrants. This is where we should think about what will be the children of these people treated like in this way. Thank you, yeah. I, 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 just, I was wanted to say yes, what after, uh, you know, just uh, Nadia and Miriam say, but for me, you know, all the friends uh, and also what Didier say about, you know, the children of his, uh, of his friends that, uh, so many friends of mine are talking about the daily ritual of humiliation that they have to encounter. Really a ritual of humiliation. 
that make them, you know, it's humiliation, it's constant. Little things, you know, like nothing, but it's switch, you know, like from morning to evening. It's everywhere, you know, in the bus, in the in the shop, you know, everywhere. And that uh, uh, is, is part of this Islamophobia that is not just, you know, the insult or the attack like that, but this constant reminder of that you are not part of this, uh, of this place and you are really excluded. And this, and especially the veil, really, that uh, and effectively we could have a discussion like that on that. And as uh, uh, Nadia said, there will be a lot to say about feminism then, you know, if we were talking about that. So uh, Yala, uh, and after we have a lot, a lot of questions, a lot of questions from the public. So Yala, and then after that, I will read the question of the of. Uh, I wanted to thank you, uh, Françoise, uh, for your question. I think it's a simple and very difficult question, uh, what you asked, because of course we have this kind of a post-colonial melancholia in France, but also uh, we have to face uh, what you call the, those unresolved uh, colonial question in France. I just wanted to give an, a kind of scandalous example uh, of the type of uh, insults you can find uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, we have a brilliant journalist, a black woman called uh, Rokaya Diallo. And uh, I remember uh, once, I think it was two months ago, uh, a man said on TV, a journalist said that if she had not been educated in France, she would have been a big African woman married to a polygamous husband with 16 children. So we are here, uh, we have here exactly what you said about the link between what Republic is and the idea of civilization. We have to domesticate those children, those bad children, and those good, and they, became, they become good citizens when they are able to say, thank you. The bad citizens are those who are always uh, just trying in those post-colonial trends to question the past of France. But just to uh, say something else, I think what is difficult in this moment is that the analyses, the political analyses are multiple. We have, of course, um, those uh, this political moment of the presidential campaign. We have, of course, uh, the fact that the, the far right has been working for years to uh, impose this agenda and uh, this kind of ideologies. But there is also a, a foreign politic in France. And what is interesting is to see also uh, that um, at the moment, uh, our country is in war in Sahel, for example, that you have new um, kind of uh, political uh, practices uh, uh, to um, restore the image of France in Africa at the same time. You have, uh, what can I say? You have um, uh, a lot of uh, advertising or you have a lot of promotion of French citizens that are described as the people of the diaspora. So we have to link, I think, all of those, um, this situation with this double language, I mean, perhaps the language of the, at the same time. That is to say that we have at the same time, some uh, scholars, scholars of colors, because this is what it is about, trying to um, question those, this, uh, colonial past of France, and at the same time, you have reconfigurations of the African uh, French politic. So I think I would love to, to question that because I think it's very difficult. You have a lot, we, you, we have a lot of expression of what is called France Afrique that are reconfiguring themselves now in Africa. And of course, all those scholars based in France who are questioning the colonial past of France are also, in fact, questioning the actual uh, relationship between France and its ex-colonies. And I think it is also at the core 
of all uh, the debates and all the, the, the discussions we, we have now, perhaps, yeah. Well, thank you, Yana. Uh, just, you know, um, some of you know, know me, so I will remind everyone that France is still a colonial, has still a colonial empire, right? That there is New Caledonia, Kanaki, the island in the Pacific, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Guyana, Réunion, and Mayotte. And in some of them, like in Mayotte, you do also have incredible Islamophobia because we know the Comoro archipelago are absolutely you know, majority Muslim. So there is that also that quite often disappear when we speak about France, but it's there, you know, and, and France is still, is still having, you know, colonial, colonial territory, which had to your point, uh, Nadia. So, I mean, so many questions, we got like so many, so I have to start. I'm, I'm gonna read like three of them and then you will see uh, who want uh, to answer, okay? So, uh, David Palombolio, what are the best way people outside France can help? You know, Nadia, <laughs> how can they help, you know, outside of the uh, French? Uh, what are the connection? Uh, okay. Uh, the the identity, identity politics are imported world south from the US. What can we say about that? Do the panelists think that Macron fight against Islamo leftism is a winning strategy toward the presidential election? Does not it risk to exacerbate racism and Islamophobia in a way that will make citizen vote Le Pen since she is known to have defended a tough stance of Islam? for a long time, okay? So identity politics, uh, best way to help, and is it a good strategy for the presidential? Okay, so I will read two more because there are so many and I don't want. Um, Anna, uh, Donna Jones, uh, um, Didier and Yala, do you think that crisis political and historical prompt universalist Okay, uh, yes, that the crisis, political and historical, prompts universalists to retreat to a cynical reactionary form. French universalism, as Sanger mentioned, is really French first. Is such a reactionary universalism an indication of what is imaginable for an unfranchised multiracial state? Uh, excellent point. Um, okay, there is um, from our friend Ashil Membe. Uh, thank you, thank you. But um, one sees similar trend in northern European country, such is the case in Germany, where the reaction is clothed in the language of anti-Semitism, while accounting for the specific historical trajectories they take. How do we begin to read these forms of late Eurocentrism? beyond a national frame as a global movement in their own right. So that's it for now. Who want to go first? I mean, you don't have to answer, of course, all the questions, you know, you just have to uh, raise your hand, as we say. No, nobody? Okay, Nadia. Yeah, so there was a question about uh, what what could be done by scholars abroad, and I, th I see at the bottom another question about better forms of allyship. So maybe I can address all these together. I think they point to the same questions. I think uh, to to go back to my point about fatigue and exhaustion, and I, I think one 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 thing and also that links back to Sindri's comment. I don't know if Sindri, you're still still around, but it's just to maybe uh, support uh, academics based in France and just continuing working by, you know, uh, also just helping providing us with like opportunities like these to just talk and think and 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 just think together and make progress in our in our discussions I find this conversation today is extremely helpful for me and um, and I think you know you can't just dismiss the the level of um, yeah just 
uh, exha exhaustion every day. It just it just takes away time from our own writing, our own work. It's just it's just like this feeling that every day whenever you hear the tv the radio you read the news it's just everywhere so there's this feeling of being completely overwhelmed and it just sort of gets to you so i think any any sort of uh, forum that allows for the continuation of collective work because this is what's at stake this is what's attacked it's this notion that ideas should not circulate you know we should just sit very nicely in our little office and read i don't know renan maybe and that's it and i mean of course this is not going to happen but right now uh what needs to be uh done is on the contrary a, a focus on continuing transnational work and international work with with the us with the global south and just continue imagining together ways of encouraging these transnational conversations and that links to my to my second uh, point um, uh, I think there was an, a question about identity politics and this issue of contagion and um, infiltration from the US or something and um, I I mean I thought that what uh, uh, Nadia uh, Yala was saying about um, how separatism, the language of separatism occurred and became prominent really after the uh, Comité Adama protest is so important and so true. And I think that actually maybe suggests that um, there, is, there is something about not just a fear of US uh, ideas produced in American campuses, I think maybe the trigger the turning point was this connection of solidarity of grassroots solidarity between us protesters against police violence and black uh, anti-black racism and same in france with different language but when you go back to all the comments it was then that it was really a moral panic about some part of the french uh, uh, sort of conservative establishment look at all these ideas about race that they're infiltrated and I think there's something around this notion and this vocabulary of contagion that was triggered by the presence of black bodies in the French public square, which is the first in, in sort of the French, I mean, in the, it, to that extent. And I think uh, it's, it's just, this is the conversation. It's not about identity politics. And I think we're sort of missing the target when we're talking about whether or not ideas circulate from uh, universities in the US. I think what's really at stake is, is these grassroots solidarity, uh, so forms of solidarities. And just I'll finish there. I think maybe a productive way to keep thinking critically about these issues is to just drop altogether this notion of republicanism because to be honest it's not even according to the sort of right-wing standards it's not even about republicanism anymore i think maybe a more productive concept would be that of puritanism what's a what what's at stake right now is not puritanism in the sense of american protestant etc but it's this sort of ethics of purity Remove and also in the context of the pandemic, and as you said, David, the exhaustion, etc. But it's like remove any source of contagion from you know immigrant bodies, black bodies. Just remove them. Just make sure that France is just being protected from all source of impurity and the ritualism that you were describing, Francois. That that the sort of sense of like the pressure for citizens to conform not to ideals, not to values, but to bodily practices that are deemed the only ones acceptable to fit in. This is ritualism, this is tribalism. It's not, it's not even Republic anymore. So I think it's just, we need to step up, you know, the conversation and the, and the sort of critical discourse and just not buy into this discussion about Republic and all. I think it's something uh, much more dangerous right now. Well, thank you. I, I, if I may add something, and I have the right to do that, since uh, and and because also there was a question about how the Stora report fits into that. It's also because Yala, you were talking about uh, the foreign policy. What's happening in Algeria, I think, also is is quite you know reflecting the the movement, the social movement. What's happening? It's 
troubling also the constant the almost a certain pleasure in France that you know it's if it's failing you know the fact that independence cannot win you know there is when there is an anti anti colonialism in France a fact that to say decolonization failed and especially in Algeria that's also for me some kind of a little secret any other uh, answer to the question you know um yeah, I can, uh, I can say something. Okay, so I'm talking. Yeah. Um, so um, so to, to start with the, the last one, Achille's uh, question, uh, of course, we were asked to talk about uh, attacks uh, against critical theories in France. So we, we spoke about France, but but he's entirely right to, um, to, to, to think uh, uh, or to suggest uh, that we should think uh, on a uh, uh, more international, if not global, uh, level, and these um, uh, uh, the, these uh, these issues that we've been uh, uh, talking about are uh, are can be seen from uh, from Brazil to India, from Poland to uh, to uh, hung Hungary. Um, and uh, but even in uh, as you mentioned in countries where you would less expect it um, uh, although the situation in G that's Germany although the, the situation in Germany is very complicated around the question of uh, uh, of anti-semitism as he as he knows uh, well um, and and I think that uh, Although we uh, only uh, David, I think mentioned it, or maybe others, I, I may be wrong, uh, mentioned it. In the background, uh, there's this uh, Palestine-Israel uh, question that that is that remains. Uh, you cannot read um, uh, some of the reactions and some of the reaction uh, to uh, uh, we, we've been talking about if you don't have in mind uh, the positioning of uh, uh, many intellectuals uh, in relation to, 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 to a defense of, uh, of the, the politics of, of Israel and, and the, the shift from critics of that politics to uh, anti-Zionism to uh, anti-Semitism. And so, so this is uh, this is very obvious. I could I could give very precise examples. Uh, I will not, but I, I could. Uh, so so it it is something that is in the in the background, very uh, little mentioned uh, because uh, uh, because of the uh, of its uh, very sensitive character. But but it is very important. And so in a way, I would say uh, the the. Uh, the, the, the question about what should we do, how could we help when we're uh, when we're uh, uh, abroad? I would say do it in your country. Uh, you know, if, if we're talking about the United States, uh, that's something I wanted to 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 say, uh, but uh, for lack of time, I didn't want to to develop it. But at the moment, you have uh, in New Hampshire, West Virginia, and Oklahoma legislator legislators discussing bills against quote the propagation of divisive concepts you have uh, bills uh, in uh, missouri mississippi arkansas and south dakota uh, introducing the banning from teaching in public schools of the uh, very uh, very important new york times 1619 project on the history of race and slavery so and I mentioned, I've mentioned other countries before. So I would say, you know, uh, it is very generous to look at other countries, but but the the struggle starts in your in, in your uh, in your own. Um, and and is it is it a winning strategy for uh, Emmanuel Macron to try to go to the to the right? I think that's what he thinks. Uh, he thinks that. Uh, at the at the last moment when there would be uh, a, a, a duel between the two uh, between Marine Le Pen and and himself, uh, people will not dare to uh, to vote uh, for uh, not well to, to to not vote for him. Um, what appears now is that there's an increasing number of people, especially of course from the left, 
who have been so disappointed that they say uh, we will not vote for him. Uh, and so it might be just a, a, a threat, uh, but 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 at the moment uh, it I, I've been saying for years to my colleagues in the United States that there was absolutely no chance that uh, Marine Le Pen would win the election uh, in a presidential election in France, uh, and I was convinced of that. Right now. I, I cannot. I, I would not say. I would not say that. I would not say the contrary either. But I would not say that. And and for me, that's that's a huge uh, uh, change uh, in the way I see my, my country. It's what we said about Trump in 2016. Yeah. yeah. Watch out. Well, you know, to to also uh, add to what just you said, Didier. Uh, I mean, long time ago, when Italian communists went to Vietnam and met with Ho Chi Minh, and they they said to Ho Minh, what can we do? What can we do to help Vietnam? What can we do? And so they repeat the question and finally Ho Chi Minh said, do the revolution in your own country. That's how you will help Vietnam. Yeah. So you see you're right. Okay, any, Muriam? Thanks. Um, I have a lot of comments uh, just to say in what good company I find myself tonight. So thank you again. Um, I wanted to get back to what Nadia was saying about the threat of the grassroots level. Um, and I do think, you know, if you look at the laws that are being put in place, part of it is about any social movement um, being able to dissolve grassroots organizations. I mean, this is the real threat. And I think part of the, the state's imaginary is about institutions like the CFCM being able to have state bodies that do the work of controlling these uh, discussions. Um, and, and I think that also ties in, Francoise, to what you were saying about the Herak uh, and the, what, Yala, what you were saying about uh, colonial memory. Thinking about the Rapport Stora, there is this notion that it's the state's role to write this history, um, that it should be the French state uh, and the Algerian state that somehow come to terms, um, right? And, and the kinds of words being used go back to what Nadia was saying, right? Repentance, repentance, repentance is a Christian notion. Um, and so this need to calm uh, colonial memories at the state level um, completely, I mean, it does two things. On the one hand, um, it completely ignores the ongoing demands by the Hirak and uh, Algerians living in France that uh, Macron stops doing things like celebra celebrating and congratulating Teboun, who has been elected uh, illegitimately in the eyes of many Algerians, uh, to stop deploying uh, police forces, uh, Jean Damari, into the Sahel and continuing this military uh, neo-colonial France-Afrique. So I think we're also at a moment where this uh, juxtaposition of grassroots versus state control is dominating um, the ability to both come to terms uh, with colonial past as if, you know, as if the state needs to, to somehow do that, but also as a smokescreen for ongoing neo-colonial policies. Um, and I would recommend everybody look at Noradin Amara and Afaf Zekour, who wrote a great article in Mediapart. Um, and I would, you know, for people who are interested in the rapport Sora, I would send them there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add something uh, and to go back to what was said. Uh, first, the, the, perhaps the, the question of uh, solidarity uh, among uh, academics. Um, I think it is a very difficult question, a very tough question. Uh, not only because uh, all those uh, reactionary movements came from the academia, because I think that the the scholars that are targeted are also targeted by their colleagues. But the thing is that um, it is very hard now to uh, organize a kind of um, political battle, not only uh, not because we are weak or that because we have integrated the uh, idea that we were not powerful anymore, but because the work we have to do is the work of a political party. I mean, we don't have the time to uh, create new languages to oppose to those uh, alt-right concepts that are thrown in the, in the public space. This is not our work. This will be the work of people that are uh, try working uh, in communication for political party. This could, should be the work of uh, politicians 
And now at the moment, we don't have those um, spaces and those uh, kind of uh, political uh, strong solidarities that could in a way protect us. Uh, one other thing we could say, we could use the justice and we have to use the justice and the justice institution to condemn all those people who are endangering now the scholars by uh, saying that they are uh, complicit to Islamism or that they are, uh, that they are pr producing knowledges that are uh, in, um, in ideological foundations to terrorism. But just one example. Uh, yesterday uh, we had, the, I think it we had, we had the, 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 the news that uh, Nicolas Sarkozy uh, was condemned by the justice because uh, for many uh, histories of many stories of uh, corruption. What is the reaction reaction today, in the media, or in the political sphere? The reaction is that he is innocent and this is a political plot. So even the justice and those institutions that are supposed to protect us and to be strong are now taken in these uh, strange moments where they are uh, weakened and where are, when, when all the, the vocabulary and the languages we use make them fragile. So it is very hard to, to fight now because as scholars, our work is exactly what you said, Nadia, is to put the right noun on right on the things. Of course, what we are living now has nothing to do with republicanism. And I think that some people can still defend this idea of republic, even the idea of uh, universalism, which is really strong and powerful in the political struggle. But the fact is that what we are facing now and our work is to put the right nouns on things. And what we are facing now has nothing to do with uh, republicanism, has nothing to do with the new expression of uh, universalism. It has to do with what Stuart Hall called racial fundamentalism. This is fundamentalism. And we have to fight uh, against that. And there is only a, a last things that I, the last thing that I wanted to say, uh, it was more with uh, what uh, Donna Jones uh, asked about the, the multiracial um, uh, republic. I don't remember exactly the, the question, but of course um, uh, we can quote, there is a, a black French intellectual history uh, in, our, in, um, in my country, I mean, and uh, there is a black French reinterpretation of uh, universalism. And I think the work of uh, Cesar and Senghor try just to uh, show how the, 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 this French republicanism was linked to uh, colonial history. And that what they, we had to do now is to recreate new terms to uh, rethink a new kind of universalism. And of course, a universalism, a real universalism is built on differences and not on their canceling. Thank you. Okay, other question, another round of question about the working class. Uh, you know, is the working class in France uh, totally whitened? Uh, and also opposing racialized workers and therefore supporting extraction abroad for their own you know, privilege. About uh, Macron, is it opportunism or you know, what's happening or just you know, white supremacy? A question about Charlie, you know, I am Charlie and you know, all, the, all what created around, you, know, you have to say I am Charlie. And in a way also what uh, did you remark about the murder of Samuel Paty that we had also? I mean, all this um, uh, demand that we have to say something, that we have to, to, to say a certain thing, not just we are against, of course, we condemn the murder, but we have to have the sp specific word to say that. To Yala, there was a question about what do, could you say about the impact on, non, on young, oh, sorry, young non-white scholar on scholarly production. And um, I think already that, um, you know, I mean, yes, about Charlie, was Charlie somehow just supposed to be understood as being a scientific concept or universally transparent one to boot? Okay, so 
is there uh, anyone who want to answer this different question? And uh, I mean, just also to say um, about what, I have also a question perhaps also to Didier and, uh, and I mean, to, her, uh, to the four of you, because we talk about the left and we talk about the right and the center and the extreme center. But there is, I mean, there is also a critique of the left that was made by Césaire already in discourse on colonialism, of course, and in his letter of resignation in 1956 and then later on by Fanon, but not just by Fanon, but also by people in Guadeloupe and Martinique and Réunion, but nobody knows their names. And this is something, the connection between the left in France and colonialism and racial thinking that has never been really, really, I mean, in my, I don't think I've never really been really uh, discussed. It's remained totally on the side. What is your thought about that? I mean, the decolonization of the left, you know? I mean, it's ambiguous position constantly with Madagascar, Cameroon, you know, into China. I mean, not always the same, but nonetheless, and to this day, towards uh, police violence, what is the crime, the, you know, and, uh, you know, impunity of the police, uh, the question of Islamophobia, and the fact also that uh, uh, in the huge demonstration, uh, 2019 or 2020, against Islamophobia, said uh, uh, 2019. The fact that some uh, people from the left, um, among them Mélenchon, participated is today, you know, also uh, used against him. So how do, how do you see that also? You know, because it, it's connected to some of the questions. It's not the exact question that I raised, but, you know, connected to this question. Miriam? Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to say a few words on Algeria, and I think this goes back to the question of the fragility of the Republic, but uh, Maurice Thorez, you know, in the 1940s saying, uh, you know, it's a nation in formation, it's not a nation yet, and that the class struggle has to come before any solidarity with uh, anti-colonial nationalism, and I think we know that story, that's a story that is told, um, but for example, when French leftist Trotskyist anarchists go to Algeria in the 1960s, many of them team up with Ben Bella, they help him do uh, land redistribution, etc. Um, and if you read the archives of those, they basically say, you know, he's not a real leftist, you know, this, this is feudalism still, and eventually the Algerian people will have a real revolution where they discard themselves of these feudalist trappings of Islam. And so, I think there's a longer colonial history of the left and the way it engages with decolonial struggles that was, you know, to a large part, of course, there were exceptions, um, but was nevertheless uh, in large part on their terms, the way they saw the world. And I, and, I, and I think this comes back to the question of identity politics, where in the US, we think of the work of Mark Lila, um, you know, and this is often brought up by the right that identity politics is running away with society and we, we're not able to analyze class anymore. Um, often in France, it's a question on the left, uh, as was already mentioned about the, the book, um, the Race et Science Sociale book, right? This was uh, by people with good leftist credentials who nevertheless, um, you know, blame certain uh, sections of the academy for having racialized what is actually a social question. Anyone else would want to, to say something? Nadia? Yeah, I can maybe address the, the question about uh, the working class and divisions. Um, uh, so there, there are polls every day that try to make us believe that um, 60% or 70% of the French society is actually uh, convinced that there is an Islamo-Gushist threat. And so that's one thing, but um, there's, a, there's also a number of um, sociological studies that uh, have shown that society is actually maybe not as polarized as uh, some uh, politicians wanna, wanna us to believe even in the aftermath of the uh, Charlie uh, and Bataclan attacks. Um, and that they have been able to find mechanisms and, and, and ways to address 
conflicts on a grassroots everyday level. Uh, one quote, for example, Jay's book, uh, La Guerre Civile n'aura pas lieu, or Jérôme Truc, sociologist, uh, very uh, uh, important work also on the reaction of French society to, to, the, to the attacks. And so they, they, these works are very important because they show that there is a level of resilience and, and, and uh, re rejection of polarization on an everyday basis. Now, in terms of the working class, I think the Gilets Jaunes is an interesting case. Um, uh, Didier was mentioning early on the, the, the debates that Macron sort of proposed at the national level. And there's this interesting story of a case where um, Robert Menard, the sort of far right uh, mayor tried to impose to, to, to one of these debates, the topic of migration and identity and the gilets jaunes that gathered then that they were like, no, 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 we don't wanna talk about that. We wanna talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, our uh, economics and social issues. So, they, so this image that according to which there's on the one hand, the gilets jaunes that are like these sort of racist hillbillies. And then on the other hand, the, 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 the banlieue and that they're divided, this, this actually doesn't, doesn't correspond to what actually happened. I think there's, there's more work to be done on, on the, the possibility of these coalitions, but what's interesting in the example of the Menar episode is that there was just a spontaneous rejection of, of, these, of these people, of, of this sort of racist agenda. So uh, I think this, yeah, there's, it's, it's not obvious at all that there's this clear dichotomy between the working class and the migrants or is Islam and, and uh, identity. Yeah. Did uh, yes, uh, maybe to follow up on this, uh, on, on uh, uh, Nadia's answer about the working class. So <clears throat> there's this uh, uh, belief, again, that politicians push, uh, and you see that uh, in not only um, in, uh, in France, but also in the United States for the Trumpist vote. Uh, that it comes from uh, from the working class, and so you would have the, the working class would be both uh, racist and uh, um, uh, voters for uh, for the uh, Rassemblement National de Far Right. Um, I would I don't want to say that there's not something of that, uh, which is uh, which is in particular. Uh, because uh, in, in the case of the vote for the Rassemblement National, uh, because of the uh, uh, disappointment that they've had from the, the, those who have been in power from the left and from the right, and with very uh, little uh, structural changes and, and benefits uh, for uh, or, or uh, uh, improvement of the situation. Uh, um, uh, so I would not want to uh, to 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 consider that it's absolutely not true, uh, but, but it is extremely exaggerated and it hides the fact that behind, uh, that, that the vote for the Rassemblement National is, is also from, uh, from middle class and from, 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 from upper class as well. Um, and, and asking uh, for, about the question, uh, uh, is the, is the uh, working class now a white working class, if, if I understood well the question? Uh, I think there's a, a very important presence of uh, uh, of uh, people of color in and, and uh, Af especially uh, 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 sub-Saharan Africans in in certain jobs and uh, in particular uh, everything that has to do with construction uh, a, a lot of what has to do with um, uh, um, restaurants but in the in the backs the the, the part that you don't see and also uh, uh, and that's very gendered uh, the the whole uh, economy of care uh, which is really uh, uh, possible on for all older people in particular which is only possible because because of these uh, uh, these uh, uh, usually African women or or women of African origin 
Um, so, uh, so there's there's still a, a very uh, important presence in the working class of uh, of people, the majority of them uh, uh, being documented, but uh, a minority being undocumented. And and we, as you can imagine, and it would be the same in the United States, uh, the the part that is undocumented can be uh, much more. Um, uh, 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 exploited, uh, the salaries are lower, the protections are, are, are usually uh, none. Um, uh, the, 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 the question, so I'm not sure I understood the question about uh, Charlie and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, uh, the beheading of, um, of uh, Samuel Paty. Uh, one thing that if, if I understood part at least of the question, uh, one thing that is remarkable that is, and do with what uh, what I was referring earlier uh, after Nadia and Yala about the fatigue is that every time you have such uh, uh, such an act you have uh, interviews of uh, Muslims and in particular Muslim leaders who have to say that they disapprove that uh, that they're not uh, uh, that it's not the way they, they see Islam. So, so there's as if uh, it, because you're a Muslim, uh, you would have to uh, to say that uh, when it's not asked, of course, uh, to uh, to the to the rest of the population. And finally, uh, I'm not sure uh, I can I can um, answer correctly uh, to uh, your question, your very interesting question, uh, Francoise, about the left and colonialism, because I'm not an historian and, and uh, I, I, you know, others would, would do it, uh, um, would do it uh, much, uh, much, much better. Uh, I would say that there's still uh, this, um, uh, what remains, uh, what, is, what is the most visible uh, today uh, is uh, how uh, the, the the left uh, was against uh, the uh, the Algerian uh, colonization, how they were for the decolonization, for example, how they uh, they were denouncing torture and all this. Uh, so so you have these these heroes uh, uh, that are visible and and they were uh, they they. they they, they had a, a very uh, uh, very strong commitment to to the cause, uh, but but what was more the, more the political dimension of it uh, is uh, I think still very unexplored as you uh, as yeah, as you said, and and finally, um, uh, if if the word uh, uh, Islamo leftism was not so loaded. Um, uh, you could say, as uh, Nadia was suggesting, that you start to see uh, something of uh, uh, some political connection between uh, people living in the banlieue uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and people uh, from the left uh, in terms of uh, coalition or or coalition of protest, I would say, which is which is relatively new because uh, at the very beginning of the Yellow Vest movement, uh, the reaction of uh, the young people in particular, but but uh, not only them in the banlieue was to say, uh, well, they, they were not going to the to the to the protest and the or demonstrations, and they were saying. Uh, These people, they discover what we've been uh, experiencing on an everyday basis. Um, uh, with the police violence, etc., and race, and, and also racism in their case, but but uh, I've been observing in some of the studies that that, that I am doing that uh, you see this connection between um, uh, between the committees for justice, truth and justice, and uh, and left uh, uh, or leftist um, uh, young people. So so there's there's the emergence of something. Thing that is, of course, that has nothing to do with Islamo leftism, but is a, a connection between uh, 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 people, uh, many of them being Muslims, and uh, and 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 people uh, uh, from from the left trying to, uh, to to develop ideas. But I'm not talking about the university. I'm talking about uh, you know 
difference. Well, thank you, Winna, Diane, and Didier, to, to, to show that the question of the working class is much more complex. And effectively, they all got a lot of strike now by women cleaning, you know, the hotel, always, you know, black women, or the gilet noir also, because we talk about the, always the yellow vest, but the black vest. And uh, who are absolutely present in a very, very courageous and also bringing the question of, uh, of working. So that's, that's very important and connect to a whole history of organization by a non white working class. Uh, that is uh, that. And, and there was, and also what you are saying, Didier, uh, the rediscovery of that history also of this memory that the way it plays today also in this. Uh, coalition or you know platform of alliance. Okay, I think it's, it's going to be uh, it's time now. So uh, Yala, uh, you have uh, since you did not, uh, you have the last. I mean, one second, two seconds to say something. <laughs> two seconds. Okay, uh, I just so wanted to whatever you know because we have I will to wrap up. only said uh, I would just wanted to um, to answer to the question about the racialized scholars, what are they doing uh, in the academia? Uh, first, it's not because you are racialized that you uh, make a revolution in the academia. You have to have a reflexive way about what are the problems of the academia and perhaps how the, 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 the relations of power are um, shaping the academia. But what, it is, what is interesting uh, is first, um, what kind, what did, there are racialized scholars, I mean, there are scholars of colors in France. And for example, in my discipline in philosophy, uh, what did we do exactly? We just brought the world into philosophy and we dismantled the, the, the racialized history of philosophy that is taught usually in the university or even in the elementary uh, school or in the lycée, sorry. And this is the work, this is the basic work of uh, decolonizing the university. And I think that those, this process of decolonization are really important. I think that many people, many students are seduced for good reasons to those processes because they, we are all just saying very simple things. I mean, for example, just for black people, black people think. And I have to say that just this little statement was very hard to affirm sometimes in my institution because I remember but when I, when I became a, a associate professor in uh, my uh, university, the first question people were asking is, are they writing texts in Africa? If they don't write text, they are not able to think or to produce a philosophy. So you have all those cliches, all those ideas, all those uh, what we could call the geographies of spirits that are still shaping sometimes the academia. And I think that many people and many scholars of color are just breaking this, not to destroy, of course, the academia, but just to decolonize, I think, the, the corpuses and the libraries that we are teaching to our students. And I just wanted to say um, just a, a, a little last thing, but it's more French. I remember a, a discussion I had with a, a, the great historian uh, in, uh, in Paris. His name is Patrick Boucheron. And, uh, Patrick Boucheron. and uh, the thing is, we have a pun in French that, is say, that says, faire des histoires, make a fuss of something. And what is interesting is that, for example, the history of colonization is never seen as the, a part of the French history with the big hash, but only as those little stories of those people who font des histoires, who make a fuss about nothing. And this is what is about, how this country uh, will be able to understand that his, its history is shaped by their stories, that is to say, our stories. So this is the point I just wanted to finish with. Well, thank you, Yana. Thank you, all of you. I mean, I know that there is a lot of questions we did not answer, and there will be much more to say. And I'm going to leave the last word to David. But thank you again to Muriam, Nadia, Yala, and Didier 
for the conversation. And thank you, of course, to David, to the team of Ushri, and to everyone who came and to listen to us. David? Um, so thank you. Just uh, three almost sloganeering comments. Uh, the first is that exhaustion is is used as a strategy to disarm the left. So speaking as a Californian, we need to get some sun in order to re-energize ourselves uh, again and again. Uh, you know, um, the aim is to exhaust and one has to, of course, resist that. The second is identity is also a white right relational condition that uh, divide and rule was perfected under colonialism as a political strategy of control. Um, and if you think there's no claim to identity on the right, I mean, generation identity just expresses it explicitly. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think one has to say more than that. And then thirdly, Nadia's very important point about the relation of, of separation and purity, which you call Puritanism, uh, is a general racist strategy and was pointed out by Lacan in a rather obscure paper that what he called segregation and purity always underpin racisms. Um, so that there's a way in which um, segregation is a reach in order to um, enable uh, the, poss uh, the possibility of, re of retaining what is, what is conceived as a claim to, to uh, purity and puritanicalism, uh, if one can put it in those terms. So, you know, how we create a kind of set of globe, you know, or extend global relations as an organizing strategy without, of course, intruding upon um, sort of local leadership uh, in, in, in development, I think is very important. Uh, this has been really quite an extraordinary discussion. I want to thank you all, Francoise, Vergez, um, for your incredible engagement as always. We always seem to um, do really interesting things together. So we should continue to do this, um, you know, uh, in perpetuity. Uh, and to uh, Miriam Haledevis, uh, uh, Nadia Mazuki, Didier Fasson, and Diala Kisukiri, just thank you so much for a really uh, extraordinary engagement. Um, we have recorded this, so with everybody's permission, we will post it. Uh, we'll give obviously the panelists a chance to weigh in, but we'll uh, post this for others to uh, engage with these um, ideas. Uh, thanks so much to be continued uh, to the staff of UCHRI, as Francois said, always. Uh, a big shout out and to all of you uh, stay safe. And as a um, recently passed politician in the US says, make good trouble. Thanks very much. <laughs>